May that song truly prepare us and worship our God all the more as we listen to the message this morning, Dreamer Come Truth, the story of Joseph, preparation for dying. Once again, I give to you the messenger of God's word for this morning, Pastor Noel Espinosa. Today used to be called in Christendom, All Hallows Eve. And that is the day before the All Hallows Day, which we now know as All Saints Day. Uh, we know it better today as Halloween. While it still has the same meaning semantically, it is no longer the same in the cultural connotation and practice. This has been associated with parties and horror fun about death. TV programs have their Halloween specials and then commercial stores will have promo products, of course, to uh, promote their business. But you see, dying is anything but fun. In human experience, we know it. And even more so in biblical teaching, because vitally connected to the issue of dying is our belief in an afterlife condition. And about that, there is just an abundance of superstitions. For the Christian, it is a matter of divine revelation. What has God said concerning death and after death? And God has spoken his mind about the afterlife. But God's revelation, you must remember, is not given in one package as though one uh, big revelation is given and everything is known by anyone who receives that revelation. Not everything is present in every stage of biblical history, history and we need to reckon with the historical stage of a passage and ask what they know at that time concerning any issue of God's revelation. Now, this is how to make sense of the conclusion to our series on the story of Joseph as we come to his point of dying. It took us five months in our series following Joseph from his early dreams as a 17-year-old, seeing himself being exalted and his brothers and even father bowing down to him but instead what followed were <clears throat> a series of misfortunes as far as the human perspective is concerned until all those things we see have been woven by God in order to bring him to exaltation, to the rank that is just below that of Pharaoh of Egypt. The peak of the story is reached at the point of his revelation to his brothers, his reunion with his father Jacob, and when Jacob died, he had to reassure again his brothers that his forgiveness is real because that forgiveness is not because simply of the presence of, of his father Jacob as a restraint from avenging himself upon his brothers. Rather, his forgiveness and reconciliation are derived from his faith and that is faith in the sovereignty of God. So we saw last week that God's kingdom rule exercises sovereign control for good purpose for his people. Now, I have described the Joseph narrative as beautifully woven, and that is so even until the end. And we will now come to the end of the life of Joseph. And I would invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the last verses of Genesis 50. Genesis 50, 22 to 26. Then we will jump to one verse in Exodus chapter 13 and verse 19 and another text in the New Testament, Hebrews 11, 22. So the first is Genesis 50, 22 to 26. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation the children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him 
and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now jump to Exodus 13 and verse 19. This is now the point that the Israelites were let go by Pharaoh after he could no longer endure the plagues. And notice here what Moses put to fulfillment uh, Jacob's or rather Joseph's uh, request of his brothers. Exodus 13, 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. Now we jump to the New Testament in Hebrews eleven twenty two, and the writer here sees the act of uh, or the, the will of Joseph as far as his bones are concerned is an act of faith. Hebrews 11 verse 22, by faith. Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. So it is interesting here that Joseph, though the youngest among the brothers, with the exception of Benjamin, would be facing death even before his older brothers. But he is at this point 110 years old, we are told, and the experiences, experiences he had gone through finally are taking their toll and he would die earlier than his brothers. We need to see this in the light of the state of God's revelation at this time. Remember, at the, at the time of Joseph's life, no scriptures were yet written. Moses would be the one to write the first five books of the Bible. And so at the time of Joseph, there was no scripture yet. The word of God was present. Joseph received the, received the word of God by dreams. We no longer do so. We receive the word of God according to what is now written. But there was the word of God, but it was not as complete as we have them now. So we are at the advantage as far as knowledge of the afterlife is concerned. So what Joseph knew about the afterlife is to be drawn from his request to his brothers. And what we see here is that Joseph could look for some future about his dying. And it is still based on his belief that God's covenant promise will be fulfilled. But insofar as he was concerned, that promise went so far as to the possession of the promised land. This was the covenant given to Abraham that he will possess the land that God has promised, the land of Canaan. At that point, Joseph was giving his will to his brothers. They were in Egypt. They were not just slaves that will happen at a later generation, uh, but they were in Egypt. But Joseph, as far as he could foresee the future, could see that God must fulfill his covenant promise. And that is the promised land. That is Canaan. And as far as his death is concerned, his bones will not remain in Egypt. And so he made an arrangement through a final will that his brothers and, of course, generations after them will bury his bones in the promised land. And that is because of his belief that even beyond his death, God's covenant must be fulfilled. I draw this message from this. God's kingdom rule is certain of its fulfillment of its truth. Not in this life, but, the, uh, but at the consummation of all his promises. Ang makaharing pamamahala ng Diyos ay tiyak sa katuparan ng katotohanan. Hindi sa buhay na ito, kundi sa kahustuhan ng lahat niyang mga pangako. God's kingdom rule is certain of its fulfillment of its truth. Not in this life, but at the consummation of all his promises. We began with Joseph's initial dream of exaltation. For that, his brothers disowned him, sold him as a slave. But ultimately, after a series of misfortunes, the dream comes true when his brothers and later Jacob also bowed down to Joseph. Uh, and that shows the certainty of God's word, then given by dreams, but the word was as certain as it is now to us in its written form. So the Joseph story is a display 
in very beautifully woven story of how God's word is certain. It is going to happen. Though it does not immediately happen as one might expect, it does happen according to God's wisdom. And now Joseph is facing death as per the knowledge he has of God's revelation. The one thing he was certain at that point was the promised land, the people of God, the Israelites, the children of Jacob are going to possess the promised land. So he made the arrangement that his bones be buried at the promised land. Now we have a better and a more complete revelation that jo than Joseph ever had. And we should learn from him with greater truth how to prepare for what cannot be avoided. And that is the conclusion of our lives. And there are two things I want to draw from Joseph's attitude that we should also emulate in terms of our facing the ultimate. One is the anticipation of fulfilled covenant by God. Ang pag-asa sa katuparan ng tipana ng Diyos. Anticipation of fulfilled covenant by God. And the second thing is preparation for fruitful conclusion of life. Paghahanda para sa mabungang katapusan ng buhay. Preparation for fruitful conclusion of life. Those are the two things we see. As we conclude the life of Joseph, the first thing is his unbent, undiminished and a belief and faith in God's covenant. We have here his anticipation of fulfilled covenant by God. Until the very last, Joseph's thinking is oriented to God's covenant with the patriarchs. His words to his brothers are, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So Joseph mentions the three generations before him, from Abraham, Isaac, and his father Jacob, the promise was given to Abraham first, repeated and renewed with Isaac, repeated and renewed with Jacob, and now Joseph is acting on the truth of that covenant, it will be fulfilled. And in so far as he could see, and that may be as far as he could see, the promised land will be the possession of God's people. So as far as his dying is concerned, the way to prepare for that is to believe that God's covenant will be fulfilled. And therefore, he believes that even when he is death, his bones will yet be buried in the promised land. It shows a man who does not entertain any doubt about the certainty of the promised land because he does not entertain any doubt about God's covenant fulfillment. And that is a lesson to us. What God has pledged in his word is certain of fulfillment beyond one's dying. Ang Ipinanata ng Diyos sa kanyang salita ay may tiyak na katuparan na lalampas sa ating kamatayan. The covenant that Joseph trusts is a covenant that went so far as to the promise to the, to the patriarchs of Canaan, the land of Canaan, as the promised land. It is also promised that through the family of Abraham, the whole world will be blessed. And there is not much that we can say Joseph knows prior to the writing of the scriptures. Uh, does he believe in a heaven or in a hell? Those are things which will be what we call anachronistic. That is, you are putting a time that we know towards the future and forcing that knowledge into the past. At this point, that is not the thrust of Joseph's faith. Joseph's faith is as far as the covenant has promised, that's the land of Canaan, and therefore he could be assured that his bones will not be left behind in Egypt. That they, they must be buried in the promised land. The implication that Joseph could gain as much from that is that there will be honor beyond his death, the honor even of a burial in not in a foreign land, but in the land of promise, that is what Joseph could see. In this will of Joseph, 
belief in continuing to be a beneficiary of the covenant even after death, this is the seed of what later will be a much greater revelation of God that after death there is continuing benefit and profit for the true believer in Jesus Christ. And that is why our hope, our anticipation is not what we could gain in this world. Our anticipation ultimately is not what we can become in this world. Joseph, for all that he has reached in an exalted way as a vizier in Egypt, he did not count that as the real benefit beyond his death. But we can say whatever Joseph knew at that time, we know so much more. The afterlife for us is not just bones to be buried and given honor. It is about a soul that continues to exist, that perpetuates beyond the decay of the body. There is the soul that will have its existence. If you are in Christ, the Bible says you will be with Christ and that is far better. If you are not in Christ, then you will be reserved for the final judgment. Joseph's trust that his remains will finally be buried in the promised land is something that we could use as the exercise of faith in something beyond death. And we are at a greater advantage than Joseph. He could only think of his bones. We think of our souls. It is not only that Joseph's dreams have come true. The dreamer has become truth. Because it now perpetuates beyond death. I'm amazed always at the instinct God built into animals to perpetuate their species. There are some species that will die just after making sure their eggs have hatched, like some species of octopuses. And then you have wildebeests who will, uh, that will make their migrations. And as they migrate, many of them will fall prey to predators, and yet the species will move on. Well, for us, it's not just the species. It's the reality of the perpetu perpetuity of the soul. And when we die, it's not just about bones. It's the soul. And the point is that God's covenant pledge in Jesus Christ is so much broader than that which was given to Joseph as patriarch. It's not just a promised land of a piece of territory uh, somewhere there, which we now call the Middle East. It is now the heavenly presence to be with Christ. Second Corinthians 5, 8, for the Christian, it is absent from the body, but present with the Lord. That is why a true believer in Christ can say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And to die, in a sense, is far better because it is to be with Christ. So the perpetuity of the soul is now that which we have as we face the reality and inevitab inevitability of death. And my challenge to you, I'll put in a form of a question, what is God's covenant pledge that applies to you now beyond this life? What is that pledge you are holding fast to? Anong pangako ng Diyos ang pinangahawakan mo na lampas sa buhay na ito? If the promise that you are just holding fast to is all about business, all about worldly ambition, all about worldly care, then you know little of God's real covenant because God's covenant is not about our life in this world. Now remember how Joseph in the initial revelation he made to his brothers understands and he communicates to his brothers that the reason why uh, he has undergone all those misfortunes is to prepare him to be exalted so that God may preserve a remnant 
As I told you, that's the first time the word remnant is used in the Bible. And that's how Joseph understood why he was put in that situation so that God may continue his redemptive plan. Because remnant will become a very prominent theme in the prophetic literature. That God is going to continue his redemption through a remnant which finally finds fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. So one explanation for Joseph enduring his travails is he could think beyond himself. He could think of God's cause, not just his, his interests, not just his little cause. He thinks of God's cause. He endured the evil of his brothers. He endured the false accusation of Potiphar's wife. He endured the forgetfulness of the butler when he was in prison. All those things until he became second only to Pharaoh. And it is all for the cause of God. And because Joseph could think of God's cause beyond his little cause on earth, he endured. And when you think of the cause of God, you yourself must you must understand is you're only a small part that contributes to it. If you only have Genesis, well, you will say that Joseph is perhaps one big story of the whole plan of God. But now you're looking at the 66 books of the Bible and you realize Joseph is a good story, but only a small part to the whole cause of God that he maintained and perpetuated through generations. Now that is your life. Your life is a small part of a very big cause if you offer yourself as a, an instrument to the cause of God. If you see yourself only as a small part to that cause, then it gives your life meaning. It is not all about what you obtain in this life. The problem of many Christians is they could only think of the meaningful in terms of earthly life. It may be their personal life, their family life, their business and vocation, perhaps even their ministry. But they could not think beyond life of the cause of God. The cause of God will continue. The kingdom rule, as I always call it in every message of these 17 messages, this is the 17th. I always use kingdom rule. That is the cause. And your life, for how many years it may be lived, will be a small part contributing, hopefully, to that cause. Those believers are the most meaningful in their life who know what it is they are living for and they are willing to die for. Joseph sees his place in the preserving of the starting remnant of the nation of Israel, but he accepts that it is not God's will for him to live, to see the fulfillment of the promised land. It will be beyond his life. And all that he could do is prepare and make an arrangement that his bones be buried in the promised land. For that act, the writer of, the writer of Hebrews gives Joseph an honored place in the whole of people of faith. He believed in the certainty of the future. So he lives by the covenant pledge that it will happen even if it is after his life. His bones will be ready. And when it did happen, Moses does not forget the pledge. Generations after, Moses will carry the bones of Egypt, proving true the covenant pledge of God. Joseph is gone, but the covenant of God is continuing and is getting fulfilled. And Joseph has had his share in that covenant cause of God, in the kingdom rule of God, and that is sufficient for the servant. And we have now the greater responsibility and insight now. God's kingdom rule is moving on because of Jesus Christ. And guess what? It will move on beyond our life here. So you do not think of your life or ministry or whatever it is you are doing as something indispensable. You are graciously used and you are to be thankful to God for that. But God's cause is greater than you are. 
longer than your life and it will move on far beyond your life or mine. It was also month of October. The year was 1555 when one of the more celebrated martyrdoms happened under the persecution of Queen Mary of England, known in history as Bloody Mary. The martyrs were tied together and they were Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, both clergymen of the Church of England, but followers of the Reformation. And Queen Mary, a, a committed and devout Catholic, would have none of that. And so she had them burned. But as the fire was being prepared, Hugh Latimer encouraged his colleague, Nicholas Ridley, by saying, Master Ridley, take courage. Today, a fire will be lit that will open the eyes of England. And there's a, the man who, there's a man who could see beyond his life. And the cause of God will continue. The kingdom rule of God will move on. And that's his comfort, even as he was facing death. Anticipation of the fulfilled covenant by God. But there is that individual attitude. Secondly, preparation for fruitful conclusion of life. Paghahanda sa mabungang katapusan ng buhay. Joseph appears calm in accepting the inevitable. Is he not afraid of dying? Well, there is a natural fear of dying. But what we see here is God's faithful servant may expect fruitfulness until his service is concluded when God appoints. Ang tapat na lingkod ng Diyos ay makakaasa ng mabungang paglilingkod hanggang tapusin ito ayon sa itinakda ng Diyos. There is no doubt about the place of Joseph in the advance of the kingdom rule of God. Especially he was among pagans. A condition that is something like many of us. We live among unbelievers and yet in that condition we saw Joseph refusing to become an Egyptian. He refused to be what I call Egyptianized. Many will covet that position of Joseph but they only see the beginning. Perhaps the Joseph the dreamer, and they see Joseph the ruler, and they don't want to see the many things that come between. But what was promised at the beginning of his exaltation, fulfilled at the end that he became second to Pharaoh, in between were tragedies and pains. If Joseph jumped from his dream to the rule of Egypt, he would have made a mess of it. What comes between is important in the tapestry of God to weave his beautiful purpose. And finally, when Joseph has to face death, it shows that he has retained his Hebrew faith. He was not Egyptianized. Had he been Egyptianized, he might have a place in a pyramid for an Egyptian ruler. And that was the illusion of the Egyptians, thinking that having a pyramid for the burial place of their rulers will ensure a good afterlife. That's nothing but illusion. Joseph was not Egyptianized. He retained his Hebrew faith in the covenant that God gave to Abraham so that at the point of dying, even with a little revelation, he knew he acted on it. He accepts that when he is gone, the little he contributed to God's cause will be continued by others. Here is a man who knows his place in the kingdom of God, but also knows what is not his place. It is sufficient for him that he is fruitful in the way of God's appointment and then accepts when it concludes. What is it to be fruitful? And not to have an exalted position as Joseph had. It is to be in the place of God's appointment, doing your task so that you may have something to contribute to the cause of God in his rule. That is what we want. John Lennon of the Beatles has popularized that song, Imagine There's No Heaven. 
And then he invites, you may think I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us. And many are joining the dream of John Lennon, but his dream is nothing but illusion. To imagine there's no heaven, no hell below us. Well, let me tell you, God says there are. There's a heaven for his people. There's a hell for those who are not in Christ. And if you are not in Christ, no matter how you imagine, you will someday, like that rich man in the story of Jesus, lift up your eyes and find yourself in hell. And the only way to escape the wrath and justice of God is in Jesus Christ, upon whom that wrath and justice had been meted out. So come to Christ. Let not this story go to waste for yourself. If you are still not in Christ, the ultimate generation of Joseph through his brother Judah is Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate fulfillment. And my challenge will be, again, another question. How are you preparing for a fruitful condition of service? For the kingdom rule of God, paano ka naghahanda sa mabungang katapusan ng paglilingkod mo para sa kaharian ng Diyos? It would not have been lost on you that every message of these 17 messages has the phrase God's kingdom rule. Why should I use that at the time that the family of Jacob still lived in Egypt? And in fact, after Joseph, they will become slaves. That is exactly how it was with Joseph. He had a dream of exaltation only to be a slave. But he never lost his faith in that dream that he had as a 17-year-old. And when it happened, finally, he finds that it is not in him, but rather Yahweh behind all the events so that he may fulfill his purpose and carry on his cause of redemption. So in this present life, it does not appear to many that Jesus is reigning. It does not appear to many that there is a kingdom rule, but we act by faith. Meanwhile, we are to be giving ourselves diligently wherever we find ourselves appointed by the providence of God. We see providence here from the time of Joseph's dream, finding himself in the pit and then sold as a slave in Potiphar's household to be accused wrongly and unjustly in prison and dungeon to be forgotten at least for a while until he finds himself in the palace. What a beautiful weaving of the providence of God. And beyond that providence, we see redemption. We see this through the restoration of Judah, the brother of Joseph. And from Judah will be the one born in the tribe of Judah, the Lord Jesus. You see, the beauty of providence leading all to the cause of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And you are missing the purpose of God if you are missing Christ. You may still think of God. You may still think that God is blessing you in your business, and in your life, in your studies, in your ambition, and still miss Christ. And you miss the purpose of God for all this tapestry of his providence, and that is redemption. And that is why I call this, instead of the more usual expression, dream come true, it is dreamer come truth. Because out of Joseph, the dreamer, will come the truth. The one who said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. And so I ask, and ask yourself, am I ready for my conclusion? Every day is a step closer to the conclusion. And as you grow older, the more you become conscious that the shadow of the conclusion is being cast on you. Next month, in fact, tomorrow, November, will be our anniversary month. 
we will be 40 years as a church. And there is so much that could have destroyed us, but for the grace of God. God is still weaving his providence in his beautiful tapestry. He is fulfilling his redemptive promise. How long the church will continue, I hope, for generations to come. But there is no promise that a local church will always continue. What will continue is the universal church, the cause of God. And your life and mine, a small portion of that tapestry. And what we are to exercise as our faith is to believe that when we are done with our cause, when we are done with our service, the Lord will see fit to give fruit to what we have done. And we move on to glory for others to continue on. So after Joseph, we will have Moses and the judges, and Joshua and the prophets until the Lord Jesus. And after you and me, and we conclude our lives, God's cause will continue. That is our comfort. Uh, you expect me to use as an illustration what happened exactly on this day 504 years ago. Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on his church door, the castle church of Wittenberg in Germany, because he could not take the deception that a certain priest from the Netherlands, Johann Tetzel, was uh, imposing on the minds of those people he was pastoring. They were give, being given a false hope about the afterlife. They were being told that if they bought a certificate known as the indulgence signed by the Pope, that their future is certain that they will have a shorter duration of purgatory and their relatives as well, as uh, Tetzel even made it a jingle when he said as soon as the coin on the cafe rings, the soul from purgatory springs and many uh, were sold out to that deception. And Martin Luther could not take it as a pastor and at least know some truth. And he nailed 95 points of argument. He meant it for an academic debate. He had no idea that that piece of paper he nailed on the church door, which was a common act, nothing uncommon about that. But that nailing of the 95 Thesis, God will use to continue his cause, make a big leap of his cause in the time of Martin Luther. Martin Luther will die, and so would the reformers for us all to continue. And you and I too, as Joseph, will face our death. I do not think it will be at 110 years old. but Nonetheless, we will face dying. Let it be our comfort that at the end, God has used us for his cause. His cause is the all-important reality of life in the world that will be fulfilled beyond our death. And it is our comfort to be used for the cause of God. And that cause will move on beyond us and let this be our uh, delight and joy as we face glory we will be able to say then and then realize how much we owe to our God and so as a response let us sing this hymn when this passing world is done when has sunk the radiant sun when I stand with Christ on high looking or life's history then Lord shall I fully know not till then how much I owe.